Our next guest is internationally renowned for his writing on architecture and urban planning. He has mounted exhibitions here and abroad, like Hybrid City in the Vancouver Art Gallery, Vancouverism in London and Paris. He's been a great messenger, telling the story with keen insight about what we as a city have done right and what we have done wrong. Please welcome Trevor Body. I wanted to be an astronaut. I want to be an astronaut. My mother tells me one of the first non-English words I mastered was Sputnik. <laughs> I was thrilled when Yuri Gagarin went into space. I didn't know what a Russian was, but this amazing guy had gone to space. In fact, in my late teen years, my best buddy, a brilliant guy, Yuri Rubinsky. He got credit for being a Yuri and for being Russian. <laughs> the Apollo, the Mercury, and the Gemini astronauts were my superheroes. I knew all of their names, their biographies, their backgrounds. I, I drew their rockets, their spaceships, their training planes. They were absolutely what I wanted to be. Here we have uh, a Gemini capsule, an actual one, in a museum, in a kind of display with a fake astronaut. Uh, museums will come up later. I also made a kind of archive. I clipped every picture I could get from life, from look, National Geographic, whatever. I made a kind of dweeb archive of space pictures, of aerospace, of rockets, of spacemen. I wanted to be an astronaut so bad I could taste it. What did I do? I became an air cadet. <laughs> I'm a middle class kid from Edmonton, Alberta. My dad was a druggist. I'm the eldest of six boys. I grew up in a hockey team. <laughs> Testosterone poisoning by the time I was 18. Uh, I moved in with a girlfriend at 19 and never wanted anything but the company of women ever since. <laughs> so, as a middle class kid, the way to become an astronaut was to learn to fly. So, I joined the Royal Canadian Air Cadets, uh, put on a uniform, I, I marched, uh, I polished my boots, all of that. This is a more recent online shot. Back when I was an air cadet, there was no girls in it, damn. Uh, and, and our uniforms were even more dweeby, if that's possible, than those here. But I did all that. I was even in the honor guard, I mean, holding a flag. Did all of that. And I polished and I marched and did whatever I could. And at age 17, I went for an interview to get a scholarship to learn to fly. And I don't know what I said or what I did, but somehow something impressed so at age 17, I learned to fly on this airplane. Okay, we did it the same way they trained the pilots in World War II. A six-week course. Remember all the Commonwealth Air Training uh, Program, which bought uh, pilots from Australia, New Zealand, England, even US, and they learned to fly on these prairie aerodromes in six weeks flat, and they were shipped off to Europe. We did the same system. And in fact, even on the same airplane. If you look carefully at this amazing airplane, I think one of the masterpieces of Canadian aviation design, it's called the Fleet Canuck. If you look carefully, you see the ripples on the back of it? That's because it's a wooden airplane with canvas stretched around it. It was a World War II trainer. So we air cadets spent six weeks every morning doing weather, mechanics, checklists, all the book learning. And then the afternoons at the Edmonton airport, we learned to fly. So these airplanes were like the models I was making. The balsa models, et cetera, with stretched paper and canvas over them. Um, and then, of course, I drew. I modeled and I drew. I drew airplanes. I drew them in elevation. I drew them in plan. All of this, of course, was a perfect training for an architect. You know, my passion was flying. I wanted to be an astronaut, but those are the skills I developed. So, 
linking this to my, what I do now, to the city, to Vancouver. I went off and I did an arts and humanities degree in Edmonton and went off and studied architecture, um, turned down a tenure track job in Halifax to practice and then the, there was a recession in Alberta. They didn't need architects. A guy called Doug Shabolt, brother of the painter, Jack Shabolt, offered me a job here at UBC. So 30 years ago, I came to Vancouver and started teaching architecture. I was so lucky. My initial friends in Vancouver were all 25 years older than me. Jack, Doug, Doris Shadbolt, Abraham Rogatnik, Alvin Balkin, um, Arthur Erickson, and of course, great honor of our final speaker tonight, Cornelia Oberlander and Peter. These were some of the people I met in my introduction to Vancouver and was compelled by them to give back. So I wrote about Vancouver, I taught about it, and as you know, as you've heard from Sam, I've did some exhibitions. Some of you may have seen the Gesamtkunstwerk uh, exhibition I did for West Bank last year. In London, I did this exhibition about our city, Vancouverism, um, in Trafalgar Square. What an honor to have that kind of real estate. And our ambition, our hopes, our sense of the city was such that it, it, uh, the walls couldn't hold us in. Canada House has a very tiny gallery. It wasn't big enough to hold what we wanted to do. So working with the brilliant, brilliant architect, Bing Tom, and with the brilliant, brilliant engineers, Fastenap, we devised this wooden temporary structure of undulating strings of BC cedar to be constructed wrapping around the outside of Canada House in London. It made no sense, it wasn't a practical project, it was an expression of our, of our wish, our idea. It was astonishing when it went up. You could smell cedar all the way through to Falker Square. I remember walking down from Covent Garden and smelling cedar from two, three, four blocks away. Uh, here it is, constructed St. Martin's in the Fields, the back there, the National Gallery. So we tried to, in this temporary construction of cedar, capture what is Vancouver. So in my, my second half of my talk, I'm gonna talk and link my flying past with my critical present. This is the cockpit of a fleet Canuck, that great Canadian air design that I learned to fly on. You see it has minimal instrumentation, airspeed indicator, altimeter, just a few other things. It's not a lot of gadgets. You learn to fly by feel and by stick. And it's a very, very important eye, mind, body way to fly. So, what I'm here to tell you is a different kind of message. In my view, the urban economy of Vancouver is in the early stages of stalling. When you learn to fly, you learn to stall. You take an airplane, you pick it up, you pick it up till it lose lift and then it drops. And you have to learn to do this and you have to learn to recover. This is essential skill to any flyer. And to do so, you, yes, you look at the instruments, but you also have to feel in your heart and your body and your ear what's going on. My, my sense of where we are right now in the city is that we're gonna have a tough year or two or three. The potents are not lining up well. The Chinese economy is ebbing. Commodity prices have dropped, not just oil, copper, many other things that BC produces. Um, we're in, the bond market has trembles. Europe and Japan have barely recovered and they may be the portents of a new reality of aging societies. So I think all of this means that we in Vancouver, who've had no correction, who've had no recession in housing and in land prices, will probably have something in the next couple of years. This is the best possible news for Vancouver. Why? Because I live by the development industry. It employs me, it keeps me going, etc. They've done incredible things for me. But having said that, we have become 
a one industry town, all about urban development and about very little else. We need to diversify and think more broadly. When you're learning to fly, when you go into a stall, you feel the tremors, you feel the tremors, and then it drops. And you can make some very simple mistakes as it drops. The initial reaction is to push the stick forward. Or, or, pull, sorry, pull it back, to pull out of the dive. In fact, what you need to do is push it forward to increase your airspeed, to get enough lift to come out of it. We can make some really big mistakes in this city very soon. First and foremost, with the transportation vote. We need to support public transit here. To not To vote no on that would be the equivalent of pulling the stick back. All we'll do is stall again and have to do it over again. The other thing you do when you're flying is you learn not to put things into a spin. You need control. And that control is I, mind, body. I suppose in a longer talk or a written piece, I could give you statistics, I could argue with economists, etc. Because we're still going up, everybody says it's still okay but the trembles is showing. And in six months or a year and a half, tell me what you think. I think this will be a fantastic opportunity to rejig our values, to think about a more diverse economy, to support the arts, to think about a city, to think about a, a city in the post-development era, a richer, more diverse city. I watched Toronto go through its recession in the early 90s. That is when they built their big museums, the ROM, the AGO, et cetera, under a right-wing Harris government. So I think we should not lose the opportunity of the coming stall. We should learn to recover. We should use our hearts and heads and bodies to do our best. To wrap up, I got my pilot's license at age 17. I was promoted to sergeant in the Air Cadets. I spent the last three weeks of the summer hitchhiking to Toronto and Montreal, where I met a lot of space cadets, shall we say. <laughs> I stand before you, Air Cadet, Space Cadet. Thanks for having me here.